Hideo Kojima, father of Metal Gear Solid, Shigeru Miyamoto, father of Mario and Todd Howard, father of Skyrim. There are plenty of extremely famous names in the video game world, but these people aren't the only ones creating their games. Of course, you only have to look at the end credits to realize that they have teams made up of tens, if not hundreds or thousands of other talented people who stay in the shadows to create these behemoths. And that's quite necessary given the sheer scale, so much so that I don't think these big names have peed code for a very long time. We're a long way from the days when we'd open Visual Studio to do a little Hello World in C-Hash. All this can give the impression that creating a video game can't be a one-man job. And that's where independent video games come into their own. Far from the graphics and length standards of AAA, there's the possibility of making games that are completely different on the independent scene, and possibly feasible by a single person, even if it can sometimes take 10 years. So we're going to pay tribute to these games in this video. And it wouldn't surprise me if you know some of them, but don't know the stories behind them. We're going to try and make sure we only talk about the people who made everything. Development, design, music, although of course there will be small exceptions. And if you're interested in developing video games, well Asus is sponsoring this video to show you that you can have all the power you need in a laptop that's designed to be an extension of your creativity, not a hindrance to it. And it's called the Pro Art StudioBook 16 OLED. With its 16 inches HDR OLED screen and 4K resolution, you'll no longer have to burn your eyes out on the black background of your sublime text, which will finally be able to display real black rather than the ugly old gray you see on conventional LCD screens. And given the number of hours you'll be spending on it, that's something to be reckoned with. Supplied with Windows 11 Pro, the configuration of this computer can go up to a Ryzen 9 5900HX processor and a GeForce RTX 3070 graphics card, as well as 64 GB of RAM clocked at 3200 megahertz, which can come in handy if you're a bit more demanding with 3D. Game engines like Unreal Engine or Unity, for example, allowing you to work from anywhere on your superb independent game, Cyberpunk 2078, which is a completely original work. What's really well thought out here is its storage with PCI Express SSDs with a read speed of 6800 MB slash S in RAID 0, which can go up to 4 TB. This is something that manufacturers often put aside, giving you slow storage that you'll suffer like never before with each resource load. Here, you'll feel like the PS5 with its quick load is prehistory. All this is quite suitable if you want to use motors, but this PC is also suitable for all video game related professions as it also has certifications for its slab, such as the DCI-P3 standard or the Pantone or Kalman certifications. If you're an artist in need of the most faithful color representation, you'll be well served with this toy. In other words, you'll have the tools you need whether you're a dev, a designer, a composer, you name it. The most interesting aspect of the design is the addition of the dial pad, a wheel that you can customize to your liking which can come in handy for additional shortcuts that can take advantage of this kind of mechanism such as zooming in Photoshop for example or managing the size of your brush. Given that you have much more millimetric control there's a way to be extremely precise but what kind of work of art could you create on your own with such a device? Well for example Five Night at Freddy's Hey, we're talking about something big. Five Night at Freddy's is the work of one man, Scott Cawthon. Well, he didn't do the music, but like I said, there are a few exceptions I'm willing to accept. You're probably familiar with FNAF. It's had a dozen video games, novels, a movie in the works, TikTok trends, cosplays of all the characters, and has been scared to death of animatronics ever since. This game is clearly not the first he's released, but easily the 76th. Indeed, Scott has made a huge number of games over the course of his life because he knew very early on that this was what he wanted to do. The very first of these games was Doofus, released in 1994. That's 20 years before FNAF after all. Problem, none of these games work. He even tried to make movies on the side, but always without success. These games are often considered rather empty, and above all his characters are scary even in cuter settings because we're a long way from horror games at the time. This is particularly true of Chipper and Sons Lumber Co, whose Chara design is very similar to something you've seen before. It was a bit of a cold shower for Scott, but from all the criticism he received, he picked up the best and the best from all his work and came up with something that matched his style. Five Nights at Freddy's, and now you know the success story. The game is being played a lot, not only because it's been teased on Steam, given that we're in 2012, one of the most explosive years for independent video games, but also because many YouTubers are making gameplay reactions to it once again at a time when it's popular because the days when all gaming YouTubers were still making games are long gone. Scott has finally succeeded in making a game that works, and he has no intention of letting it go. Three months later, he released the game's second installment in November 2014. Five months later, the third part 
out of the game, FNAF 3, then four months after that, the fourth. In short, he's released four games in less than a year, and with an increasingly weak quality, unfortunately, even if the game's story excites enormously, to the point that there's a lot of research on it, the gameplay of these games is becoming increasingly redundant for many, with a boring third episode and a fourth episode that's no longer scary, especially according to PewDiePie, who made a pretty violent video against this opus at the time. Since then, games have been released on a yearly basis, with Sister Location in 2016, which was the first game he didn't make on his own, followed by many more in the years that followed, and even a VR game that is truly terrifying, and which I can only recommend if you're equipped at home. What's more, if you delve into Scott's bibliography, you're bound to come across designs or even levels from his earlier games, such as The Desolate Hope, whose characters bear a striking resemblance to the most disassembled animatronics to be found in his FNAF franchise. Today, Scott is retired, but FNAF continues to live on with Security Breach getting a mixed response and a movie still in the works. We'll see how much longer we can keep an eye on what goes on at night at Freddy Fazbear Pizza. Lone Survivor One of my favorite horror games that deserves to be much better known. Lone Survivor was released in 2012, created by Jasper Byrne, and aims to be a psychological horror game, but with 2D scrolling far from the standards of the time for this style of game. We're not on a Resident Evil or a Silent Hill in terms of gameplay, but yet in terms of sensations experienced, we're very much there. We're not talking about boo horror with a screamer, but about an almost permanent feeling of discomfort comfort as we do everything we can to survive. And it's clearly a success, despite the fact that you can already see everything in the rooms given the way the camera is positioned. The game is therefore rather enigmatic with a story that's not necessarily understandable and endings that are sometimes upside down and the two that were added with the director's cut version don't help. But all this is intended by Jasper, who is trying to give people the chance to ask themselves questions about what has just happened rather than chew them up as is too often the case these days. The use of resources like pills, why the world is the way it is for Jasper, nobody has really understood the meaning of his game yet, and that's the beauty of it. And in this case, he's the one who's done absolutely everything, so it's really his game. His name is all over it, from development to music to graphics, and given that there's no trace of any possible engine he might have used, we wonder if he might even have created it himself. He was already in the industry before his game, working on other terrifying projects, such as Kinect Animals. You know, that terrifying game where you had to pet tigers using the Xbox Kinect at a time when Microsoft was doing everything it could to make people think it was cool. Personally, I think Amnesia is for kids. Since then, Jasper has done other things, notably in music, creating like the best video game music the world has ever known. Does Hotline Miami ring a bell? Well, he made Hotline and Miami. Yeah, it's a very small world. And above all, it shows just how much projects come together. And when lots of talented people do something together, it makes for one hell of a behemoth. So I can only advise you to play Lone Survivor, even if it's 10 years old, and even more so if you can wait a little, because Super Lone Survivor was announced a short while ago for 2022. With lots of redesigns, in short, a superb coincidence Incidents with the time when I wanted to make this video, I'd probably go back to it too. Papers. Please, easily one of my favorite games of the last 10 years. The principle is super simple. You're a customs officer who spends your days checking people's passports, and you decide who can enter the country and who can't with the help of this magnificent stamp. By the way, I'll only give you the green stamp if you subscribe to the channel and show me your bell membership card, otherwise you'll be refused entry to the rest of this video. The principle may seem simple, but the game's mechanics are becoming increasingly complex, requiring additional documents for example, but also on a moral level, where sometimes the game will do everything it can to get you to let in a person who isn't in order or vice versa, which will bring the emotional and the respect of the rules into confrontation. This game was created by Lucas Pope, formerly of Naughty Dog. In fact, he worked on Uncharted 1 and 2, not at all the same style of game. Development of Papers Please began in 2012 and took a total of nine months using the OpenFL game engine. This is not his first game, as the universe proposed in this game is linked to that of his first game, The Republia Times, which he released during Ludum Dare 23. A competition where the aim is to create a video game with a constraint and above all a very limited time of a few days. It's an extremely well attended event. And if you're looking to get into video games, I can't recommend taking part enough as the time constraints and rules imposed force you to be creative with many games coming out of these Ludum Dare events such as Evelan, Mini Metro and Titan Souls. Coming back to Papers Please, the game was a phenomenal hit. Thanks as much to its original static yet stressful gameplay as to its philosophy. With its 20 possible endings, you'll be making tampons of them. Stardew Valley.
We've just talked about a game that took 9 months to develop. Now let's talk about a game that took 5 years. Stardew Valley is a game created by Eric Barone, or Concerned Ape to his friends, which aims to be a relaxing game in the vein of Animal Crossing or Harvest Moon, but with a slightly lighter graphic style. The man is a big fan of this kind of game and wanted to make his own version without all the flaws he could find in what was already being done. And he was so keen that we should be able to enjoy his vision of this style of game that he didn't release it in early access, something that has become quite common over time. So as not to provide a degraded experience for first-time players, which is to be applauded. However, the development of his game was one of the most complicated. In fact, the man put himself through a monstrous pace, working 10 to 15 hours a day every day of the week with no weekends. He was so keen to make his improved version of Harvest Moon that he even put himself in crunch mode, the word used to describe the overload of work given to developers to complete a task in the video game world. And we're not just talking about a few months here, but four and a half years. Can you imagine playing the same game every day for four and a half years all day long? Well, that's what Eric Baroni felt with his project, which he would only leave to go to the local theater to work as an usher or to spend time with his partner. The creation of his game really became obsessive, and seeing what the rest of the world was coming up with while developing his own game, he had to make his game more and more elaborate. Fortunately, we're not dealing here with a Duke Nukem-style development inferno. If you've seen my video on the subject, you'll know what I mean, since the game will be released in 2016 and will be a real hit. Now available on every console imaginable, it's still being updated regularly, which shows that the man probably still spends an awful lot of time on it. With Stardew Valley, Eric worked himself to the bone, even to the point of burnout, but working on his own projects is always exhilarating and quite different from working flat out for someone else, as he has often said in interviews. The game has now sold 20 million copies, so the gamble paid off. Eric Barone never did too much marketing around his game, no advertising or even anti-piracy techniques. As many people who knew the story behind the game felt bad about pirating a game with so much of the soul of a person who gave everything to bring it to life. Eric has since tried his hand at other projects, but quickly returned to his baby to perfect it again and again to be his perfect copy of Harvest Moon. Cave Story if there's one game that revived the 2D platformer craze and was also the genesis of the indie movement, it's surely Cave Story. And here we're going way back to 2004. Cave Story is a platform game developed by Daisuke Amaya from A to Z, largely inspired by Metroid and Castlevania, the leading names in the platform exploration genre. The game was a real UFO when it was released in 2004 because at the time we didn't have as many tools to help us develop video games as we do today. Here we don't have Unity at hand, but the in-house engine that our friend Daisuke Suka, known as Pixel on the networks, had to make. The gentleman spent five years developing his game in his spare time, and it was a rather anarchic affair. Given that there weren't to the help of people on the net, notably a certain Nao Ueda, who was to be of crucial importance in the design of Cave Story. The game was released at that time and became a benchmark for many. It's often cited as the game that created the independent movement, so without Cave Story we might never have seen the creation of Meat Boy, Fez, or so many others. Since then, the game has gone through a huge number of versions on PSP, Wii, Nintendo DS, Switch. There's even a version for the TI graphing calculator if you're bored during class. All this was made possible by Caitlin Shaw, who rewrote the Cave Story engine and created an exclusive tool, calling it NX Engine, which makes modifying the game much simpler. Cave Story, under its new name Cave Story Plus or even Cave Story 3D, has seen its team grow, particularly in terms of composers, and today still offers a Metroidvania with crazy gameplay and a thrilling story, a must-have because it's such a classic and it's a fine wine. It may be 20 years old, but it's still as delicious as ever. Undertale. Of course we were going to talk about this one, although I can already see you commenting that it shouldn't be on this list. Indeed, the game's creator, Toby Fox didn't create this video game on his own. He was accompanied by Temi and other artists for the character design, but he did the game's development all by himself like a big man. But the crazy thing about this guy is that, unlike many of the people we've talked about before, he's not actually a video game designer, but a music composer. He has indeed created music for an online comic strip called Homestuck, but when it comes to video games, apart from Mother's ROM hack in 2008, there's not much. He's also composed music for much more recent games such as, I don't know if you know, Pokemon Epe et Oublié or Pokemon Echo Lighted Violet, which are coming out very soon. So it was with little programming experience that he embarked on the crazy project that was Undertale, including a Kickstarter campaign launched in 2013 and a first demo showing the beginning of the game, which at the time had already caused quite a stir, not least because we could already see Flowey, one of the major characters in the license. The game is developed on Game Maker, a lesser known engine than the Unreal Engine, but one that's easier to access, especially for a game that's meant to resemble a mother. Indeed, Toby is a big fan of this forgotten Nintendo license and the 
inspiration is strongly felt in his game. And in truth, Game Maker is a much used engine that's unfortunately too often forgotten. To name just a few of the nuggets made on it, you can find Hyperlight Drifter, Spelunky, and Hotline Miami. Yes, him again. I even made a video on this engine back then with a wonderful series called Program Moai Unmuton containing three episodes, each lasting three minutes. Phew, I'm not getting any younger. I was clearly not at ease when I started out on YouTube in 2016. My hair is clearly not comfortable either. Getting back to the game's Kickstarter, it raised $51,125 for its development out of the $5,000 requested, so the man set to work. In fact, here the project was intended to be a bit community-oriented, offering at certain levels the possibility of integrating elements into the game. For example, at $500, you'll be able to incorporate your own monster creation into the game, which the protagonist will be able to fight. These monsters being Muffet and Glide, with whom I'm sure you're familiar. The game was released two years later in 2015 and had the effect of a tidal wave. Everyone's talking about it, everyone's obsessed with its story, its gameplay, and above all, its music. After all, he's a composer at heart, so it's a good idea to showcase what he does best, music. Undertale is known for having one of the most beautiful OSTs ever seen on a video game, with music you've already heard hundreds of times, and possibly on this channel too, given the number of times I've used it. We've even had orchestras playing them at shows, that's for sure. We'd reached the point where Toby Fox was absolutely bored with his game, not only because of its worldwide success, but also because the community was so passionate about it that it was completely hysterical at the drop of a hat, making many people hate his work without even touching it. It was a bit like the Squid Game of video games, a very cool piece of work, but one that became too heavy to appreciate in view of its ubiquitous popularity on the web. Since then, another game has been in development, Deltarune, which is currently still being released, with the second chapter in late 2021. However, this project has been in Toby's head for much longer. Undertale dates back to 2013, while Deltarune dates back to 2011. He's decided to stop being on his own and lead a team, so as to be able to release the game's sequel as soon as possible. We'll see how the rest of the game turns out, but the first two chapters have been nothing but good, Minecraft. This one could have been the title of the video. After talking about Cube World in a recent video, which I invite you to go and see if you haven't already in order to discover its failure to go all the way, Minecraft for its part has succeeded in being the global success we know it to be, with Microsoft buying it back in 2014 for the princely sum of $2.5 billion. But before we get into the nitty gritty, let's talk creation. Minecraft is the brainchild of Marcus Person, otherwise known as Notch. In fact, the original name of the game was Cave Game, perhaps inspired by Cave Story. With with development starting in 2009, the game was fully released in 2011 with prices increasing as development progressed, 10 euro during the alpha, 15 euro during the beta, and then 20 euro once the final product was released. Yes, this is the genesis of early access, which just goes to show that the game hasn't been all good. This is a little before the explosion of independent gaming, so it's all still pretty nebulous. And back then, everyone swore by the most beautiful graphics possible. So a game with aimless cubes? Well, no publisher was interested. But that's alright, because Marcus intends to bring his own game to the market, taking inspiration here too from a number of old games he loved when he was younger, whether it's the procedural aspect of the ever-changing maps which comes from Dwarf Fortress or Infiniminer for the cube-based resource recovery aspect. I'm not going to go out of my way to explain what Minecraft is either, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of it by now, but what was really pushed at the time was the extremely community-oriented aspect. Whether it be for creating maps, textures, modifying the game, Marcus was up for anything the world could do with his game, and that's at a time when it wasn't as much of a norm as it is today. Okay, now we've got that in four Fortnite and soon in Fall Guys, but at the time, apart from Warcraft 3, which was the alien in this field that makes even the reforged version of the game no longer at all in line with this philosophy, few games allowed so much legal involvement. And that's a big part of why Minecraft has had such a sickly replayability, coupled with the fact that no two maps are the same, thanks to the procedural aspect. Since then, the game has been available everywhere, well, not on the same level as Cave Story with its calculator version, but still, currently running on two different versions, Java and Bedrock, it will soon be unified, making the community bigger than Ever. The game is now an institution, having exceeded 1,000 billion views on YouTube last December. What's more, it has been translated into 139 languages and sold over 200 million copies. In short, it all started with a passionate guy who wanted to make a sandbox game in Java. Obviously, I skipped a lot during this video. I would have loved to talk about Binding of Isaac, for example. But there are two developers here, and as much as I'm willing to make an exception when we're just talking about design, this one was a bit too much in my opinion. To but would you be interested in an episode two? Well, I'll let you tell me all about it in the comments to 
this video. Cave Story is an absolute banger that I had to buy four times on four different supports, that's for sure. It's easy to see that you don't necessarily need a background in development to create crazy games and that all you need is a passion to follow your dreams. So clearly, if you've got an idea in mind, go for it rather than telling yourself you don't have the skills. You'll make mistakes, maybe it'll take you 10 years, but that doesn't matter because you'll have followed your dream and in the process you'll have learned so much that you'll be able to do anything afterwards. Thanks again to Asus for sponsoring the video. I'll let you check out the bug's description once again. If, on the other hand, you think this one's too powerful for you and won't have any use for it, Asus offers plenty of other interesting models like the ZenBook Pro Duo range, which I've already shown you in other videos, notably the one in which I told you about a mysterious cartridge that I invite you to go and see or see again, but also the VivoBook Pro X OLED range, which aims to be the one that will accompany your first steps in this vast world that is creation. But what about you? What's the game you prefer that's been created by just one person? Well, I'll let you tell me in the comments. And yes, the game has to be finished. It's too easy to answer quests. Laopak still has work to do. I'll let you click on another video on the screen. I'm sure you'll love it. And until next time, well, never stop learning. Bye.